have an unidentified flying object. Researcher on a mission with Dr. J. Annie Elias. Welcome back to another episode of Researcher on a Mission, ROAM Radio, the first of 2015. I am your host, Dr. J. And as always, we have an incredible show for you. Today, you get double the fun because you have two amazing guests. First, I will introduce the one that will speak after. Secondly, and that is Linda Cortillo. Ms. Cortillo, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Dr. J. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to you, and we're going to come right back to you shortly. But first, we're going to go with Mr. Tom Reed. Tom, welcome back. Hey, thanks, John. Hi, Linda. Hi, Tom. It's a pleasure to have both of you on, and this is why it's going to be so explosive, because the listeners have heard both your stories. And throughout the years, if they've been following, they've probably read Linda's story before she even announced her name to it. And Tom, especially yours going back to the 60s, but what they've never heard was the correlation between the two. And that's what I enjoy about tonight's show so much. So, Tom, let's go ahead and start with you before we go to Linda, and then we'll go with the two overlapping uh, and the two commonalities. Go ahead and, and give people a brief background of your case and then how you came across Linda and how you two met. Okay, sure, John. Uh, I think pretty much everybody knows that our our case uh, stems from Great Barrington, Sheffield, Massachusetts. Um, you know, back in the, the mid to late '60s, and and that it had um, actually gone out on WSBS radio. There were an awful lot of uh, uh, sightings from Jug End Resort, and and um, just a lot of people in the in the area had um, given testimony to what they saw descending or performing acrobatical movements unknown to conventional aircraft. That actually, um, you know, our family actually encountered on our property b- back in the late '60s, and and uh, there were three accounts. I want to clarify that, too. A lot of people think that this was something that was just ongoing all our lives, and it really wasn't. I mean, there really wasn't anything that um, really took place until a few years ago, uh, again, which kind of uh, fueled everything. But I, I think what a lot of people uh, also aren't aware of is that uh, there's a lot of political connections to our case, and I think this is where I found a, a real interest in, in speaking with Linda and, and the political side of it because there are ties to the UN and that's kind of rare. I mean, I really only lived about an hour from New York City anyway. And and I grew up, believe it or not, my family from New York. I, when I was a year old, I grew up in the home of um, William Roosevelt, the grandson of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And my grandmother was actually like their cook. She actually worked for in Cherry Hills, Colorado. She actually worked the, at their estate. And I was actually living there for about a year before we moved back to Sheffield. And it wasn't until the 80s that my father ran for office and I helped him with his uh, mayor, right? Yeah, he was the mayor of Falls Village, which is part of Canaan. It was a suburb of Canaan. And, you know, he was heavily backed by Senator Christopher Dodd, who had come to our house for dinner. I have had coffee at. Um, the governor's mansion near Elizabeth Park in Hartford. And um, and that's also about the time that, uh, you know, he ran into attorney Robert Bletchman, who would in turn know Bud, who was working with Linda, and who I gave my, um, you know, sketches to and drawings and symbols and things of that nature way back when. And, uh, and it's interesting, too, because uh, Bud was also working with uh, Debbie Cobble, who is the one person who... Uh, actually filmed the magnetic anomalies around the one of the car that my brother's car and um in 2009 so it's really interesting the people and those that i really respect in this field and how they're all connected in some way and and most notably linda so in the um, in the in the 90s 1992 um after a long talk with robert bletchman and, and the fact that our case had a ce classification and being that he or Robert Bletchman actually worked with J. Allen Hynek. <laughs> CE4, I mean, by the way, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. For those who don't know, uh, Alan, J. Allen Hynek created four classifications. Close mm-hmm. Encounters of the First Kind, you see uh, um, a UFO, an unidentified flying object. Close right. Encounters, Second Kind, Trace Evidence, Landing, mm-hmm. Broken Branches. 
three, third kind, close counters, third kind, when you meet them, and of course the fourth kind where they take you, alien-initiated contact. Right. And and so this is how bizarre this really is. Uh, that when our case went out in 1969, it was given a classification during a year's of Project Blue Book. J. Allen Hynek gave it a classica- classification, unknown to us that the lawyer that my father would later meet in the 80s or late 80s would have worked with J. Allen Hynek, who took an interest in it, was super interested in the fact that we spent a lot of time talking about the electromagnetic fields and how it fell in the environment and the eruption of crickets and that sort of thing is really what he was interested in then. And then would befriend my father, and then my father gets an office, which a lot of people don't know this either, that there's actually a proclamation in our family's honor, and there's like a local holiday. It's, it's October 6th, and then there's also a bench in the city green, and my father had a lot of um, you know, friends and a lot of pull and a lot of credentials at the time, and, and it was really what Bletchman really wanted to have as a, a catalyst to say, look, you know, the, there's a lot of... Uh, people involved in in this topic right outside New York who who are you know they're not crackpots you know they're they're credible family members and they're in politics and and they're attorneys and and you know this is a serious subject and needs to be looked at and, and taken seriously so under that 33426 that which was like an establishment to have everybody in or other countries filter information and be able to pull from almost almost like your first attempt for disclosure. And um, so Bletchman wanted to mention our case on the backside of Cash Landerman in supporting in a supporting manner uh, to uh, because their car vehicle obviously had a lot of uh, effects from the craft or whatever. And so that that was really where it came from, but more more so the credibility of my father. And so after the UN, uh, uh, you know, the symposium, if you will, um, with uh, Mohammed Ramadan, um, who was the president of the Parapsychology Society, and and uh, John Mack was there, and uh, Bud Hopkins was there, uh, my attorney Robert Bletchman, Stanton Friedman, Linda Morton Howell. It was a big. Uh, you don't hear much about it, but it was a a significant, uh, you know, uh, a Ordeal. summit, if you will. Yeah, and and so afterwards, my father got a lot of papers back, October seventh, regarding. Um, you know, I can actually uh, stuff from the Greece Ministry, Defense, um, the Pentagon, just a lot of papers and things showing and improving and supporting that this is a real phenomenon. And sure enough, there's a letter written by my attorney about Linda. <laughs> and I just I showed that when I was in Maine and I put it on the screen. I had talked to Linda. We spent a few days together. What a super person, by the way. And uh, and so I put it up on the screen and uh my attorney asking uh, more information about the 12th floor abduction case. And so at that point, Linda and I talked and it was just uh, amazing the things that, that she had learned and, and, and the information that she has from the same event in some respects through the rep- reputation and, and the investigative work that Bud Hopkins did for her, who knew my attorney and who were collaborating on both our cases relatively at the same time. I just thought it was unbelievable. If Bud were only around today, he would be so proud at not only both of you continuing to tell your story, but the inspiration that both of you have given for so many of those who have now come forward since his passing. This is truly a phenomenon where so many people have been encouraged by people, pioneers such as yourself, who stood in the face of the ridicule assigned by factions of our government to this subject. Uh, You mentioned two important things that obviously Mm -hmm. apply to Linda, the United Nations Mm -hmm. and, of course, the attorney Bletchman. Mm -hmm. Uh, You want to continue before we get to uh, the 12th floor incident? Uh, Well, I I I guess I'm really uh, interested in in the um, there's this, this political spin on our case. You know, it's been said that, you know, your father was a politician and, you know, um, that, uh, you know, it seems to be kind of cold, and I think that sometimes the family feel comes out of this. But I want to make people aware that the reason that I speak out at all, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, my father and I were super close. He was the best person I've ever known. And he died and was killed on the same day that our case went to the United Nations 14 years later. And it's for that reason alone 
that I put my life aside and I talk about this subject. It isn't because I'm trying to promote anything or sell anything. I don't have a book. And when I find somebody like Linda, who has a very close, heartfelt feel about this as well, um, you know, I connect with certain people. And um, and I'm just glad she's on tonight. But I, I want people to really understand that this it's the death of my father that really has me, uh, you know, has driven me to to take this to the next step. So uh, he did die 14 years later to the day. And his body uh, was found with a rare fungus in its blood, his blood. And when um, it appeared to be an infection, so when he was the emergency paramedics came, rushed him to Yale New Haven Hospital, he actually was given antibiotics. And because he was a, a political figure, they really did everything they could for him. So they, you know, they gave him a double shot of antibiotics, which flatlined him basically because his heart went into cardiac shock because the fungus, the, the antibiotics they gave him killed the good bacteria in bed and flatlined him pretty much right then and there. And I just find that really strange that um, after talk of a book, 14 years later, um, and then Bletchman would pass, and then our doctor, you know what happened there. But that's getting off topic a little bit. But that is why I talk about it. Um, well, one, one good thing I really enjoy about both your cases is the witnesses. First of all, Tom, when we did a, a, a show a while back, we brought several people that were involved, but one of them being someone who actually on the day of you being taken, was it 67, 66, the first one? Mm. Tom Warner, uh, he actually saw a craft over your farm. And I thought that was amazing because that's not very often. Now, um, no. Linda, let's turn over to Linda and go with the 12th He's floor. He's an incident. artist, I think. He studied under Norman Rockwell, I think. Yes, and he has produced some fantastic images. Mm -hmm. uh, and some are actually a display. Uh, one of them you have, right? Or is it a museum? Uh, he has one of his paintings on regarding our case, uh, I think, is in Roswell. Yeah, right that's over right. our display. Well, turning to Linda now, Miss Cortillo, let's go to the year and let's talk about the 12th floor incident before we start crossing over to the cases. Take us back to, I think it was in the 80s, of course, right? Yes, it was uh, November 30th, 1989. My 10th uh, birthday. It occurred about, about 3, 3.15 in the morning. I had just finished uh, doing some backlog laundry and you know, I was working full time and, you know, I had two boys to raise. And so, you know, I had all that laundry. Well, anyway, I finished the laundry and I went to bed. And it was uh, it was about a week after Thanksgiving. And uh, I don't know, I, I suddenly felt uh, this numbness uh, travel from my toes up, you know, to the rest of my body. And I knew right away what that meant. And then I, I started to smell that odor again. It uh, smelled like almonds. And uh, so I said to myself, you know what? Before the rest of my body becomes numb, I'm, I'm just going to uh, protect myself and my family. And I saw this, this creature standing at the foot of the bed. By now, my knees are numb. And... Um, then it, it got on top of the bed, and it crouched down, looked me straight in the eyes, and hissed. They hissed. It was gray. Before I knew it, the rest of my body was numb except my arms, so I picked up a decorated, you know, a decorative pillow, and I threw it at this uh, creature. And it fell back. And then I had that afterthought. Well, now it's going to get even with me and hurt my family. By that time, uh, after that, I don't know what happened. Uh, the next thing I remembered, I felt myself fall into my bed. It could have been from eight feet or two feet or maybe even two inches, but I just plopped right back into my bed. No, so what happened was I, I called Bud Hopkins uh, the next day told him what I had experienced and what I saw in my room. I wasn't asleep. I was awake. And, um, you know, I went to his residence. We talked about it. Well, anyway, about 13, 14 months later, he received a letter from supposedly two police officers who said they saw a craft 
uh, uh, hovering over this building, saw a woman in a fetal position with three creatures uh, levitated outside the window 12 stories up. That's what I like about this case, actually. And it, you had those two policemen that contacted Bud. And when I actually I was telling Tom this, which is a total coincidence, by the way, you were taken on my birthday of all days. Uh, so that's oh just, just throw that out there. There's a, what another even crazy connection here. But when I, I first read this in an Omni 20 years ago, before your name was in it, Linda, this was just it spoke of an anonymous, anonymous woman who was taken and several people on a bridge saw this and then recently your case was on a television show unsealed alien files and apparently there was more witnesses that have come forward and specifically two drivers or one driver and a bodyguard in the limousine for the united nations general or the secretary of united nations and yet he's yeah, I, did, I i did promise him i'd never speak his name publicly but everybody knows who he is yes Yes, it, especially because his two people came forward. Uh, if they didn't come forward, then obviously he might have been stayed anonymous. But since his driver and, of course, his bodyguard witnessed what happened, they told it, and it's pretty much a given. I'm sure in the limousine, they probably pointed at him and say, take a look at that if, if it wasn't the other way around. But again, very, very interesting to see all these people. I just could not even fathom watching this. If, if I was driving on a bridge at night and all of a sudden cars are stopping and people pointing at a, a disc shaped craft that is hovering 12 stories up and then you see coming out uh, flying, literally floating, is a woman and then you see ch really small toddler sized, child sized figures going with it. You know something's up. It's, it's, it's as if everything you're brought up to believe is flat out you know, right there. It's like, it, it does exist. Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, up till this date, there are close to 100 witnesses. That's why I love both of your cases as, as fascinating because of the fact that you guys actually have supporting evidence in many different directions that people that actually saw craft. And as I was saying earlier with Tom Reed, t uh, Tom Warner, someone he had not met through his young childhood, actually saw on the day he was taken, the night he was taken, a craft over the farm. You guys are very unique in that sense. And I, I told you this off air, when each time someone speaks publicly about their case, it inspires other people. But a lot of people, you know they're speaking from the heart when they're very sincere and they, they absolutely have gone through what they have and they've gone through regression. But you guys have that extra element of witnesses. See, but the problem with me was that I see we have all these independent witnesses. At first, I thought somebody was playing a joke on Bud, a cruel joke, you know. But then, then the, all these witnesses started to either contact him or contact other people who have then in turn contacted Bud. Uh, you know, and then I couldn't deny it anymore. You know, it isn't something that one wants to believe. Right. And, uh, you know, it had gotten to a point, you know, I just told Bud Hopkins, God rest his soul, boy, do I miss him. A lot of people miss him. Uh, I said, but I didn't see these witnesses see me. I didn't see them see the craft because they're witnesses on different levels. Some saw the craft, some saw the abduction, some were abducted themselves. I mean, it was really very, um, extremely disturbing. I mean, I, to this day, I can't accept it. I feel that if I do accept it, uh, it's almost as though it's like saying to these creatures or whatever they are, oh, it's okay, I accept it, come and get me. So it's just, it's just a hard thing to uh, live with because we're not raised that way. We're raised that we're born, we go to school, we get a job, we get married or, or, or stay single, have a family, and then we retire and die. Nobody ever told us that these things happen. 
so it's hard to to stick that in there, you know, in in one's life. Um, it's it's something that really affected my family and I. Well, thanks. and then there's government involved. The Roman Catholic Church got involved. Statesmen got involved. It, it was just just unbelievable. And then we had the debunkers. Of course. Of but then, course. you know, shortly, shortly after, the, you know, the debunkers uh, came out, I learned fast that they really didn't matter. No, no, they don't. They and didn't it, matter. As a matter of fact, if now, 20 yeah. years ago, 30 years ago, when you would see a case on TV for every one minute of a witness or, or a case was being spoken about in regards to ufology, you had at least a minute of the debunker, if not more. And as time went on, you now have television shows, several of them on many different networks, talking about these cases with zero time of any debunkers whatsoever. You have Ancient Aliens, no longer has debunkers. You have Unsealed Alien Files, both which have profiled your cases with no debunkers. Yeah. But thank God for both of you, you guys had solace by meeting each other, having Bud Hopkins, and having other people who have experienced the same thing. Linda, take us to... Well, you know, you know, poor Bud. I mean, he was on his deathbed. And his ex-wife, you know, she, I guess, was very angry at him. You know, they had the divorce and whatnot. Uh, oh, man, she tortured him. You know, by using people that Bud cared about as tools to hurt him. So she, she debunked uh, my case. Meanwhile, she, she wasn't even in his life until my case was over. She knew nothing of it. You know, it was just such a sad thing, you know. But uh, you go ahead. Well, those are the I people. To, those, those I just the... had to stick that in. <laughs> well, know? no, that's good. That's good because you're honoring Bud. And, and Bud was... A helpful he was a good to, man. Exactly. He was helpful to so many people and he inspired so many people to follow in his work. And and I'm really thankful that there are people that do follow in his work, such as Yvonne Smith, Barbara Lamb, Kathleen Martin, to name a few, who are continuing in his footsteps. And of course, there was John Mack, who sadly also passed away over a decade ago. But let's, yeah. Linda, let's go now to where you and Tom finally intersected and spoke together at the conference and finally started to exchange some information and realized that not only did you have the same lawyer involved in your case, both of you, you the United Nations became a, a big ordeal because Tom's case was being presented there when the UN Secretary General, despite him not wanting to come forward, the fact that his people came forward, witnessed your case. And so obviously... Some, it's a coincidence, but at the same time, it's very important. Let, let's go to that the, part. Yeah, that thing, um, uh, on November 30th, 1989, when uh, when this all occurred, uh, we were told that uh, there was a motorcade uh, that came from the UN that early morning. They, had a, they said they had a closed-door session, and the motorcade, you know, moved further downtown on Manhattan. Uh, I meet Tom uh, last summer in Maine, and uh, he presented me with a letter uh, that uh, his attorney had written. And uh, I don't know, I was just wondering why he was interested in my case. I guess it's because uh, Tom's case was presented at the UN. Am I, am I right, Tom? Uh, <clears throat> but that letter actually uh, was written on October 5th, uh, three days afterwards. So the way that I, what I get from this letter, what I take from it, is that, uh, well, Bud was at the same, uh, he, he, he presented at uh, that 33-426 symposium in 1992. And so did my attorney, along with Mac and a few others. So what I think that's when happened, my case that, became uh, public in nineteen ninety two. Yeah, right. And I think right exactly. And I think what happened was my attorney had spoken to Bud there, it, like she said a moment ago. If I can just back up for a second, that of a lot of these conversations are are closed door. The our case was not discussed in front of the um, general assembly. It was discussed in a library. So there were a lot of those small uh, rooms where they went in and discussed certain things with different people. You know. 
and I'm from what I got from from uh, Bletchman, uh, my attorney after the uh, the symposium when I sat in his office in Manchester, Connecticut, was that uh, there were a lot of uh, information, a lot of cases and things that came from that, and that's kind of the stuff that my father ended up getting. And of course, when the letters that my father got, one of them that was sitting in my father's attaché case is about Linda. It doesn't mention her name. It says 12th floor abduction case. Well, it's pretty obvious who that is. So a lot of things were being discussed behind closed doors. I mean, even the Greece Ministry of Defense was quoted saying uh, UFOs operation are a potential danger to the European continent. And the Pentagon, uh, you know, letter I have right in front of me says F-4 jet fighter was paralyzed to fire its uh, missiles to an offensive UFO craft, and even the U.S. Department of the State, aliens from another solar system are a potential threat. I mean, the, there was a lot of things that were said there that you just don't hear every day anymore. And why there's not more information or more on this uh, symposium, I don't, I don't understand it. But there was a lot that was discussed there, and and so you've got my attorney, Bud Hopkins, John. Just picture this, right? You got Mac, uh, an attorney, the parapsychology. Um, you know, Mohammed Ramadan, uh, Bud Hopkins, Stanton Friedman, Linda Morton Howe, you've got all of them at the United Nations along with all this documentation. I mean, everybody was talking about everybody there. I mean, that was anything that was substantial, I think, really got discussed. And and so letters were flying around. I want to hear about this. I want to hear about that. And and there was a lot of crosstalk, you know, there was a, just a lot of information being shared that that, uh, you know, and I wanted to. I wonder yes, if Lawrence Rockefeller was there because he was very much involved or rather he was very much interested in this phenomenon. Very, very. As a matter of fact, there's a very famous photograph of Hillary Clinton walking with Lawrence Rockefeller and she's mm-hmm. holding a book on UFOs. And as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Wow. Greer and Stephen Bassett both talked about him. I don't know if he funded something, but he was very interested in getting disclosure to happen. And I think it was Lawrence Rockefeller who actually paid for a full page ad in the New York Times. Uh, you know, it, it's basically a slap to the government's face saying, if you guys aren't going to do anything about it, well, I'm going to privately uh, inform people. Let me say one more thing real quick. Uh, you just, Tom, you mentioned that the Greeks, Greek Ministry of Defense spoke about the fact that this was a danger to the European continent. And of course, we have other defense agencies. I, I, there was also, also Robert Dean, who served at SHAPE, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers Europe, read a similar letter in the 60s. Well, Project Blue Book, which was terminated in 1969 by the Air Force, which was their official mm-hmm. investigation. The sad part is the reasoning was there is no scientific matter or knowledge to be gained, nor is there any national security Issues. How can there not be national security issues when you have things that are flying into your airspace and leaving it without you knowing and can dodge every known aircraft that we're sending after it? Uh, obviously, that is a national security concern. So what they've been saying is absurd. And you have documents of the other side, which sure. show that they had a concern. So on one hand, they're telling everybody publicly it's no concern. But then you have documents proving that it is a concern, and then just common sense tells you it's, it is a concern. Well, you know what? We only know what they want us to know. But we don't know what they're holding back. That's right. And that's, that's the story. One thing, We don't know why they don't want us to know, but we only know uh, what they're telling us. One thing I should say again that I usually say when people who've interacted with uh, off-world beings, I think you guys uh, collectively, everybody who's been taken or had contact are, if not the most important, some of the top importance to ufology as a whole. And the reason being is you can have any researcher in the world study all these cases, but nobody can tell you what the inside of a craft feels like, what it smells like, what it... The temperature is like what the the what the beings feel like. I had someone on last week. He had conscious recall of his case, and he hates he hated frogs. And he said what really alerted him because he obviously was numb too, just like you said, Linda, where you couldn't feel anything. He said when they touched him, he freaked out because the feeling was like frog skin. Those details are not something you would 
if you're fabricating a story, you don't really go as far to, to talk about the smell like you just did, Linda, or right. to talk mm-hmm. about the feel. So you guys, once disclosure happens, are, is what, who is everyone's going to turn to for answers? And that's why it is so important that you guys continue to speak out. And I'm well, telling you now, you guys have so much support. And I think this is great what Bud started the revolution on and it continues to happen. Well, you know, at first, I didn't want to go public. I wasn't supposed to go public. I was outed by three debunkers. We used, we used to call them three stooges. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, and, um, you know, then I was given the pseudonym, uh, Linda Cortile. Do you know what that means in Italian? No. Dead End Linda. Oh. So, so in Italy, I'm known as Dead End Linda. But anyway, I didn't want to go public. I didn't even know what a UFO conference was until I went to one, the first one in 1992, and I was shocked. Uh, you know, there they, they was over a thousand people there. And um, so by then it was too late. I was public. I mean, people snapped photographs, and I wondered where those photographs were going to go. They ended up in other people's books, magazines, and newspapers, and that was the end of me, you know. And uh, the third man, uh, who was the uh, UN, uh, you know, he, uh, he won't admit it, thank God, but he, he won't deny it. So, you know, where does that leave us? And of course, like I said, his his limo driver as well as his bodyguard uh, came forward. And of course, you have the other 100 or so people that were on the bridge. And the bridge wasn't going. Everyone was stopped to look at the incident. Now, real quick. Well, most of the witnesses came from the Fulton Fish Market. The workers down there. They were, had, we, they, they were witnesses on the Brooklyn Bridge, but there was only one person that came forward. They were witnesses on the FDR Drive. They were witnesses from the New York Post newspaper. Uh, one of them was a um, a journalist. Uh, you know, then you had the motorcade, uh, you know, and uh, people are still coming forward. But the people who are coming forward recently, we don't know if they're authentic because they had already read Bud's book. Right. Yes. You know, so, so you know, we don't really know. I, I do want to say one thing, because I don't know if we have enough time, and I want to I want to give the rest to Tom. Hmm. Um, I just want to tell anyone who's listening out there, if, if, if you feel that you're having these experiences and you're being abducted, don't lose it. Keep your feet on the ground. I'll, I'll just give you a little advice. I know you didn't ask for it, but if it is happening to you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go in your closet, and I want you to see that everything you own, everything you wear is still there. Nothing has changed. Nothing physically has changed except your emotions, and eventually you will get used to it. You will get used to the difference. You might not accept it, but you'll get used to it, and you'll be fine. Just keep your feet on the ground, people, okay? And uh, life will uh, be different, but you'll uh, you'll be okay. And uh, if anybody out there wants to know more about uh, my case, go to the website. A uh, very close friend of mine made a website for me. Uh, it's called the, the Linda Cortile case dot com. And if you're curious, you want to know what has really happened, that's the place to go to that website. Well, while we're giving Tom, cases, exactly. Tom, why don't yeah. you go ahead and tell your website? And I'm glad, Linda, you mentioned uh, the, the, what you just said you got to accept it. And people are coming to terms. And you guys, just speaking right now, are truly inspiring those who are experiencing this but have yet to come forward. And I would not be surprised if they come forward because of your courage. Uh, Go ahead, Tom. Give your info. And then I wanted to ask you guys about Bletchman. Sure. Um, My website is – it's just T-O-M-R-E-E-D dot info, tomreed.info. 
I have a lot of information on there. And, and I like what Linda said about that. If I can just um, piggyback for a moment, I think that's what really tore our family up. You know, so many people say to us, uh, you know, was it horrible or no, it, what really happened to us, I think what we dealt with or what kind of stripped us of normalcy, if you will, because it is, uh, you know, my mother being uh, having her bachelor's in ministry and, you know, I was an altar boy. I mean, it does change your fabric and it you question everything. And But at the same time, I don't, like she said, you know, uh, you know, find a peace, you know, realize that your life will go on. And and just because you experience something very different or something that you can't make sense of, I mean, you can't make sense of something that you, you, you have no, no way of balancing it or trying to fit, you know, you know, reel it in. It just is what it is. And, and you have to move on. But I think with our case, what really made it so difficult for us was that we had that little village green restaurant in the center of Sheffield center. And it became like the, the main hub for all the kids in the area to park their bikes there and come in for, you know, uh, vanilla floats and, and that sort of thing. And it became so difficult because the town became divided. You know, we didn't live in a city like Linda did. We had a small town and a very small town and, and it divided the town and it became very hard for our family to, to stay there. You know, there were the, uh, the ones that were very supportive and of course the ones who weren't. But at the same time, once we moved and got away from it and and started over, like Linda said, um, you know, we had each other. I had my brother and who weren't he's still struggling with it, believe it or not. Um, we all are, I guess. But at the same time, you know, we had each other to uh, talk to, you know, and but it kept re, keep resurfacing, you know, the thing with Bletchman and the thing with the U.N. And, you know, no matter how many times you try to put it behind you. It was always there. So you just had to uh, find a way to live with it and understand that maybe there was a reason, you know, I talked to Linda um, about our blood types, you know, the one, you know, really looking into that and, and, and questioning or, or putting more stock into the fact that maybe there is more to the arch negative bloodline. And I think you said you were O negative too, right? Uh, yes. Uh, at least, uh, you know, that's what I know from the last time I had, uh, uh, you know, my right. blood uh, type taken. Well, according you, to Yvonne Smith, almost, if if not all, uh, most, I, I want to say, because I want to, the reason why I'm saying most is to cover myself in case I'm wrong, but I, almost every case she's presented me, if not all, uh, each person has that blood type. And so it's almost a commonality, which I would presume since these uh, since these beings usually follow family lines, it's very probable that your generations above you and below you are also involved. So that is possibly why. Well, there's something else if I can interrupt for a moment. Here's something unique before we run out of time. Uh, I do think there is something to the O negative. I really do. And and I'm not sure if you know this or not, but during um, this started way back when during the, uh, you know the 60s in Vietnam where the government started tracking everybody with O negative blood because you were the universal donor. So Linda and I, if you want to get back to the whole political thing again, we were tracked from birth by the US government because you know, because we, we were O negative blood. Yeah. Oh, 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 I see what you mean. Yeah. 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 And so again, you know, we were kind of thrown into that whole, you know, uh governmental uh you know, uh, red flag from the beginning. And it just, oh, no. again, there's just a lot of little different things. But um, I do, uh, I'm put, starting to put more stock into that, you know. Uh, and I think that the O negative uh, bloodline, I think, was probably the original blood type of man. And I think it's a good platform to build on. And I think this has a lot to do with genes and and uh, DNA and, and that sort of thing. So um, anyway. I don't I know. There want... are a lot of abductees out there that are, don't have that blood type. That's true. They may very happy well first generation. Yeah, but do they do their families? You know, I I look at what happened with us. Um, there's nine of us that are uh, Rh negative. Now we're not all O negative. My brother's A negative. My ex wife was A B negative. My son's A negative. I'm O negative. But but um, you know, you ask yourself, you know, how how would somebody if you were 
you know, we tag an animal and we set it free. You know, maybe we're looking for a certain thing, but just because we come across the, uh, you know, maybe it's a shark, right? It may not be the shark we're looking for, the type of shark, you know, um, but we still tag it and set it free until we find what we're looking for. So Tom. I think this probably happens to a lot of people. It doesn't necessarily mean they're all oh negative, but I think the I think the majority, and certainly from talking to uh, Yvonne as well, and uh, David Jacobs and the rest, you know, of those I respect. I think that um, they've helped immensely. I would. Think I so. think you're going to find that the ones who have um, repeat contact, there might be something to their to their blood type more so than those who aren't Rh negative. But that's not my field of expertise. Well, but it just seems. I'll tell you though, you know, I worry about, um, especially if the blood passed away. Mm-hmm. I worry about a lot of that disease out there that don't have the support I had. You know, some of them don't have support group meetings to go to, so that. I mean, the reason for the, these support groups is so that, you know, these poor people don't feel weird or isolated, you know, or, or just feel left out of things, you know, and I worry about them. I really do, because there are people out there that don't have any support, you know, and I, I wish I could help them, but... Right. Um, well, I think you are. Now, and, uh, honestly, I really think both of you are as we speak. And the fact that all these support groups are popping up uh, and, and again, just by them, you directing them to your website will make them realize that they're not alone and they will seek out help. Yeah. Um, I got a question for or yeah. a tweet for directed here. One, one, I think someone's going to be writing one for you, Linda, in a second. This one is directed to you, Tom. Uh-huh. Uh, this is from Miss Michelle. It's retweeted by her from which originally Ruth Perkins Cotto. If I mispronounce that, please forgive me. Hi, Michelle. said, read, please say what happened after the white slash envelope window appeared in the bedroom with you and your brother. That was actually my son. Um, yeah. Wow. That was, uh, that was fairly recent. That was really the only other encounter, encounter I should say, that um, my brother and I piggybacked around the same time. We both had a an experience. His was more documented, so we focused more on Brownsburg because that's where they, all the investigative teams went and everything. And he had, that's where the the evidence really stemmed from. So we focused on Brownsburg. Um, but um, yeah, uh, my my son was actually uh, well. There were okay. And it, it was about, it was a two, two twenty in the morning, give or take. And, uh, then again, I don't talk about this much because it's one of the few things that I still find again, you know, hard to talk about, um, cause it's more recent. I, uh, it was, God, it was, it was pitch dark. I was laying in my bed and I had white sweatpants on with stripes down the side of it and they were fairly new. And, uh, I, uh, I woke, I woke and I was like Linda said, I was wide awake. And uh, my feet were almost straight up towards the ceiling fan. My neck and shoulders were on the on the bed. And the room was lit up. I could see the clock. I could see what time it was. Um, and I was like in a panic. I had a hard time breathing. I, I, it was like I had a cork in my throat. And um, I couldn't really move anything. Um, I remember my mother referencing how it felt like she was confined to like a mannequin. You could only move her hands and her feet. Yet, I was asking myself, how how come my pant legs, this is how aware I was, how come my pant leg was not sliding down my legs? Because it wasn't like an elastic at the bottom of them. They were just stayed right there. And then I remember being shifted, and I was actually rotated to the right as if I was, I had a tanning bed in my bedroom at the time. And I was, now it was like fragmented, but now I'm over my tanning bed. And I was looking back, I was able to turn my head and I, in my eyes, and I was able to see that the numbers on my clock. And I knew if I, if it changed another minute, I, my, my, I couldn't hold my breath that long. I mean, I was counting the minutes here because I was felt like I was choking. And, um, and I, but hard, as hard as it was for me to move my arms, I was able to move my left arm just an, a little bit, but it was like pushing against a solid wall. I mean, it was that, whatever was around me or whatever was keeping me elevated. I didn't feel hands. I didn't feel a board. I, my pant leg didn't slide down. It was almost like there was absolutely no atmosphere in my room is really what it felt like. And I was just, and yet I was straight as a, as a board. I wasn't, you know, um, you know, bent or my back wasn't bent over. I was level as could be. And 
and then it was just bang. It was like it was over, and I was on top of my bed again. I jumped up, and I ran into the bathroom, and I, t- I sat on the toilet, and I turned on the faucet, and I was – you know, dousing my face with water and everything. And I was catching my breath and I was like, what the hell was that? You know? And then I heard a scream. As a matter of fact, the the boy that was with my son, when um, I ran in there and this, what, what she was referring to that little window over my son's bed, he's actually here and downstairs right now. And he doesn't visit that often. So there's another (laughs) coincidence. But anyway, um, I heard the scream and I ran down the hallway, and uh, my, my son had the bonus room, you know, over the garage. It's a big room. And his friend Thomas was on a mattress on the floor and had spent the night. And, and um, my son was sitting straight up and just sweaty and, and um, like almost like drenched in sweat. And um, he was just like he saw a ghost. And I was really still at this point really shook up. But, I mean, it was just a moment in our lives that we'll never forget. And I grabbed him. Are you okay? And. And, um, and he really wasn't even almost responding to me at first. He would just sit there like a stiff as a board. I said, you okay? You okay? And, um, then, uh, his friend Thomas, uh, who was on the, on the floor there from, um, Florida, uh, Jensen beach. He, um, he said, oh my God, you know, I saw this whole room like light up earlier. And then it was, he, he's like, just basically collapsed back on the mattress we had on the floor for him. And, um, and I was looking at my son, like, what happened? And he, all he would say was that it looked like a silk pillowcase that was over his bed, like the size of a pillowcase, but like a silk. And it was like a squarish window that was over his bed. And um, in some respects, I say, well, why that scare you so much? But it was like he was go, about to go through it, you know, almost. And I've never really shared my thoughts on like something dimensional or what have you. And, and I really don't know where to go with that. I can just say that. I know there was something very different about my son, his abilities and his talents and his intuition and, and his tests. I mean, he's had tests from, from Crystal Lake school, Miami children's hospital right here in Knoxville. I mean, he's, he's always tested off the charts when it comes to, uh, you know, um, type, you know, a form of remote viewing or sensory. And I've got all the records here. It's going to go in a book when I finally write one. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that again, this has something I know it has something to do with our family and I and I try to walk carefully and I try to say okay well maybe we're just caught in a crossfire or something you know but there is something here and and he's really shook up about it and and he's still um for the longest time afterwards we slept with both our doors open I mean it was that it affected me and him that much that I would at, at my age and he's a quarterback a high school quarterback we would not sleep in this house after that for probably a months without our doors open and a, do- and a light in the hallway, you know, plugged into the outlet, you know, a little dome light. We just had to, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't go to sleep after two 30 anymore. You know, it, my whole biological clock got screwed up. You know, I had to stay up. I couldn't sleep until after that clock would tick after two 30 and then I would be all right. But well, you this know, I, absolutely causes PTSD. Uh, and that's why it's such a big thing. Tom, I hate well, that's to. That's what happened with my brother. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, he, when this thing happened with Brownsburg with him, you know, he's become very um, isolated. You know, he doesn't come to family functions. He didn't come over for Christmas, you know, that kind of thing. So you're right. It does. It, it's very, it's very hard. But like Linda said, you know, you work through it. And um, my brother will tell you, um, you know, it's kind of like you drive down a road and you accidentally uh, hit a dog. You know, you have to put in your head there that, okay, it was a raccoon or it was something else. You have to kind of let it go. You've got to, you know, find a way that you can deal with it, put it behind you and move on. Otherwise it'll eat you alive. Exactly. And this is why these support groups are so important. Uh, we got a little over five minutes left. So what well, I want to do Linda. is yeah, I want to Linda. ask Linda a question and then I want you both to basically speak whatever you want to tell to anybody out there going through this or any message you want to get across. Linda, how did you feel when Tom presented you and showed you a letter concerning you that you had no idea existed for over 20 years? Well, for me, it was just another mystery. I wondered why this particular attorney uh, wanted to know more about my case. And I guess it, it just left that way. Um, and there were, there were a lot of people, uh, high-level people, that were interested. Uh, as I said before, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, 
others, uh, but um, with this letter uh, with the lawyer, uh, Tom's uh, attorney or his dad's attorney, um, I mean, this is someone I never even knew of, and yet uh, he was um, curious to know or maybe wanted to research uh, my case as well. So there's, there's, there's some connection between Tom's um, experience and um, and mine. But, you know, if anyone out there wants to know more about the case, uh, just go to uh, thelindacase.com. It's, uh, it's a website that was built by a very close friend of mine. His name is Sean Sean Mears. And um, I don't know, Tom, uh, we might figure it out sometime <laughs> what the connection, what the real connection is between us. Yeah. Well, we even have some of the same friends in Greenwich Village we've never even, we didn't even know about, and we've been friends with them for a very long time. So it's just kind of weird. Yeah. 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 That's another thing. Yeah. We yeah. Uh, found out that we uh, we have the same friends. They're newer friends for me, older friends for Tom. Uh, and, they, and they're good people, too. Yes, ex- exactly. And so many of the people that are involved are not doing this for any money reasons or for any other reasons other than to help you. And, and of course, the people that are suffering from PTSD, most like you guys, you don't want the publicity. You just wanted to work through this. And and when oh, you yeah. so when you factor that in. When those debunkers say, oh, they're trying to sell books or they're trying to get on television, that's nonsense. Yeah, you want to hear something funny? Yeah. Uh, They at one time said that Bud was bilking the case, you know, because he had written that the the book Witness. You know, and I said to myself, do any of these debunkers go to work and expect to work for nothing? I mean, don't they come home with a paycheck every week? So why would Bud Hopkins write a book and not get paid for his work. I mean, he never charged abductees uh, for uh, uh, the hypnosis sessions or the support support group meetings. But, oh, God forbid, he should write a book and, and make a few bucks on it. You know, it's just uh, it's just so ludicrous. Well, you're entitled to it. I've to a point I just couldn't, you know, I said, you know, it really doesn't matter because they're such morons, you know? Yeah. Well, that's one of the if reasons I put off. If you have a... Huh? That's one of the reasons I put off writing a book because the next thing you know, someone's going to say, "Oh, they're just trying to write a book." And so, <laughs> well, I yeah. haven't written a book in twenty-five years, yeah. but I think that one of these days I'll have a book. Everyone else wrote about my case. Why in fact, this year was the twenty-fifth anniversary of my case. I think it's about time one of these days I'll have a book. I, exactly. And see, this is why this topic is important right now, because so many people are coming forward. Recently, I think I told you this off air, Captain Robert Salas dropped a bombshell on my show that that was going on before I came on this network. And basically, we were expecting to talk about Maelstrom. And no, he dropped a bombshell that he was taken in 1985. Colin Andrews, over 30 wow. years speaking on crop circles, held a secret that in 1955, he was taken as a young child. The time to come forward is now, people. All you listening out there who are suffering, don't be afraid. Look at these two brave souls who are right now giving their all, telling you what it is. Now, we are literally down to a couple minutes, and I want to give each of you a chance for a final message, whatever you want. Uh, Let's start with you, Tom, then we'll go to Linda, and then I'll close it out. Well, I just think that um, what what has been um, very helpful for us is that we had a very close family. You know, we uh, there has been uh, suggested because of the political ties in our family that, you know, it was kind of a cold setup. No, we were very warm, very loving for each other, very uh, close, you know, and we were there for each other. And and I would say that if if, if there is anything that will get you through this, it's – it's the support of your loved ones and family and friends. Now, my brother will tell you, yeah, we've lost a lot of friends. Sure we have, but we've also made some new friends. And if your friends are not going to accept something that happens to you, uh, whether it's this topic or something else, then they're, go- they're not really good friends, and they're going to they're gonna find a reason down the road to walk anyway. But it's those that are there 
for you in the tough times that become your closest friends and the ones that, uh, you know, you share the holidays with. And so with that said, um, my bro- my brother and I are close, but he is, we're both dealing with something, but my son and I are very close. Even he's, st- I've started to see something in him and, and, but, uh, you know, I give him a good hug and a kiss on the forehead and I support him a hundred percent and he's there for me. And, and he's even spoken at, um, at an event with me before. So, you know, um, it's Tom. it's a half full or half empty, and for us, it's going to be half full from here on out. That's right, uh, Linda. I'm sorry for being so pressed on time, but we got about literally thirty seconds. Go ahead and give your final message to all your listen to everybody listening out there, fans okay. of your cases. All of those who have experienced what I have, get on with your life because you know what? Whether you get on with your life or not, it's not going to change anything. What has happened has happened to you. Mm. So you might as well just put a smile on your face because it's it's the healthier way to do it. And uh, know that you do have some support out here. You really do. And, um, you know, keep your faith, too. You know, if you have faith in God, keep your faith in God. That really helps a lot. If you don't have a faith, a religion, well, then just have faith in yourself. You'll be just fine. Well said. And exactly. Faith and family and friends are very important. Linda Cortile, Tom Reed, it has truly been an honor. We will absolutely do this again. Everybody out there, check out their websites, TomReedInfo.com, as well as TheLindaCase.com. Check out my website, DrJRadioLive.com, for future cases. Join us next week for Grant Cameron, two weeks, Dr. Greer. And so many more. This is Dr. J signing out.